I believe it was Fred Durst who once mused heavy is the head that wears the crown, and surely he was talking about being a champion in mixed martial arts. The title takes a toll on a fighter like the One Ring of Power, over time it just eats at the soul, the pressure of having everyone in the division coming for your neck constantly. That said, not all title defenses are of equal stress. Sometimes unique situations leading up to the bout max out the pressure put on champions to absurd levels. And today we're going to be taking a look at the 10 that asked the most of these title holders, where the stakes were the highest. Scenarios that would either create diamonds or see champions completely crumble under the weight of the world on their shoulders. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are the 10 most high-pressure title defenses in UFC history. Number 10. Demetrius Johnson vs. Ray Borg Pressure isn't always about the opponent. There were many that felt Ray Borg was not of the caliber that Demetrius Johnson should be fighting at UFC 216 for his historic record 11th consecutive title defense, including Demetrius Johnson. In a lengthy statement released in the lead-up to the bout, DJ let it be known that Borg was not his first choice. He felt about what Sergio Pettis would sell better, but what he really wanted was a super fight with bantamweight champion Cody Garbrandt. According to Johnson, the UFC told him the smaller weight classes just don't sell and there would be no reason to book such a fight with Garbrandt. Thus, Borg was chosen for DJ even though he didn't want the fight. Then Cody got hurt before a scheduled bout with TJ Dillashaw, and suddenly, according to Mighty Mouse, the UFC wanted him to fight Dillashaw instead of Borg. A bout that DJ felt made no sense. TJ had never fought at flyweight, he wasn't a champion in another division, and there was no guarantee he would make weight. According to the flyweight champion, the promotion then did just about everything to force him into the bout. They told him he would no longer get pay-per-view points. They told him that they would get rid of the flyweight division altogether. DJ laid this entire situation out in the July post post, a culmination of he felt a career of being bullied, disrespected, and underappreciated by the UFC. The champion carried all of this with him into the octagon at UFC 216, his entire future uncertain, but he didn't let it affect his performance as he would dominate Borg on his way to UFC history. Number 9. Jens Pulver vs. BJ Penn 1 If you know anything about Jens Pulver, you know the man's a survivor. From an abusive home to the octagon, there was no such thing as quit in Little Evil and no situation better personified that than when he defended his lightweight title against BJ Penn at UFC 35. The prodigy had just earned his nickname very recently, and rightfully so. The first American to ever win gold in the World Jiu-Jitsu Championship black belt category, Penn entered the MMA scene with massive hype that only grew when he burned through his first three opponents in the UFC with one-round KO TKOs. Not only did Baby J have top-tier ground skills, he was putting people's lights out. Everybody was counting out Champion Pulver. How in the hell could he possibly compete with this new god of MMA? It's amazing how quickly we crown fighters unbeatable, but BJ truly looked at 2002, a gigantic betting favorite going into his title challenge, the entire world had pretty much written Pulver off, told him he might as well just give up. It was a done deal that he was going to lose at UFC 35, but Jens was written off in his life by an abusive father as a child, and he wasn't about to just lay down and die now. In the first two rounds, Penn was everything they said he was, Pulver barely surviving an armbar attempt, but as the fight went on, BJ started to slow, with Jens rallying hard, unwilling to give in to the expectation of his defeat. The fifth would be a shootout, but in the end, Little Evil left Connecticut with the title, despite the whole world telling him that it wasn't possible. Number 8. Amanda Nunes vs. Ronda Rousey Much like Pulver, imagine coming into a fight as the champion and basically everyone assuming you're going to lose. Nobody's even giving you a chance, really. Ronda Rousey opened as a near 3-1 favorite over Amanda Nunes heading into their high-profile showdown at UFC 207. Almost all the promotion and talk in the lead-up to the fight was about Ronda Rousey and her return to the cage after a year-long self-imposed exile following her title loss to Holly Holm. It was as if Nunes was simply an afterthought, like she was just a placeholder until Ronda could get the belt back. Joe Rogan famously told a story about hearing executives backstage discussing the fight who referred to Amanda as cannon fodder. This is the champion of the world they're talking about. While the heat of the spotlight was surely difficult to deal with for Rousey, the entire world overlooking you going into a fight must fuck with your head. Now, we all know the outcome in hindsight with Nunez totally dominating, but there had to be a tremendous amount of doubt from her camp going in. Not that Amanda couldn't perform or didn't have the tools, but Rousey was still very much considered a special athlete. Sure, the home fight was a disaster, but prior to that she was one of the most dominant forces the sport had ever seen, and with a year away, who knows what she could have done to correct mistakes and better prepare for UFC 207. Nunes would of course thrive under the pressure, her mask at weigh-ins prophetic, a hint of the mauling that was about to come. Number 7. George St. Pierre vs. BJ Penn 2 We need to be clear about something here. A super fight is not simply a fight where one champion moves up and fights a champion from another division. Yes, that's what we call it, but it has to be more than that. Don't get me wrong, that's a huge fight 
fight, but is it a super fight? GSP versus Silva would have been a super fight. Two of the best champions of all time meeting while they're still prime. And so by that definition, one of the only real super fights ever was George St. Pierre versus BJ Penn at UFC 94. The established welterweight champion versus the established lightweight champion. BJ in the middle of his historic run, GSP having just gone through Kosh, Check, Hughes, Sarah, and Fitch. Now the pressure is always on the bigger champion by nature. Even though Penn had been a welterweight, he and George previously met at UFC 58 with GSP coming out on top via split decision, but this time was different. We were nearing UFC 100. St. Pierre had quickly established himself as one of the promotion's biggest stars, and BJ was talking crazy. Everything was about going to the death. St. Pierre was going to have to kill him to win all this stuff. The hype was massive. This thing nearly broke a million buys. GSP's biggest card up to that point and the second biggest he would ever have. But as he demonstrated against Johnny Hendricks, another high-pressure situation, or even the Diaz fight, St. Pierre doesn't crack, and the welterweight goat would come out of the super fight and still via fourth round Dr. Stoppage. Number six, Habib Nurmagomedov versus Justin Gaethje. It would probably be easy to say, well, wasn't Habib's fight with Conor McGregor way more intense for him? That rivalry had been building up, there was so much bad blood, but I would argue that while that was a high-pressure situation given how ugly things had gotten between the two fighters, Nurmagomedov's entire world revolved around his relationship with his father, and going into his UFC 254 lightweight title defense against Justin Gaethje, he would for the first time in his entire life fight someone without that man who'd raised him since he was a child to be a fighter. This was the only world and life that Habib had ever known. Quite literally since birth, he'd been training for this moment, his father's dream, for him to be the best in the world. Shortly after Habib's bout with Tony Ferguson at UFC 249 was canceled as a result of COVID protocols, the Eagles father Abdul Manap would fall ill from the virus. After two months of battling, he would pass away, leaving Nurmagomedov without his lifelong mentor in the lead up to the bout with Gaethje only three months away. On top of what had to have been an incredibly difficult camp, Habib was dealing with the grieving process, as well as contemplating giving up on the one thing that had always defined him, fighting, winning, his father's dream, 30-0. But it was his mother's wishes to walk away. So much had to have been going through his mind as he prepared for that fight. His entire legacy on the line in the wake of losing the most important person in his life. The Eagle most definitely came into UFC 254 with a heavy burden, but still performed incredibly. Defeating Gaethje in the second round via triangle choke, his emotional outpouring after the fight and while speaking on his father while announcing his retirement, a product of the difficult journey it was getting to the end of his career alone for the first time. Number 5, John Jones versus Vitor Belfort. It was a uniquely bad time for John Jones heading into his bout with Vitor Belfort at UFC 152. The light heavyweight champion of the world was already starting to slip a bit. The squeaky clean persona many fans had suspected was inauthentic took some damage after John's DUI crash of his Bentley the May before the fight. Then in late August, as a result of Dan Henderson injuring his knee and pulling out on short notice, Jones was asked to switch opponents for UFC 151 to Chael Sonnen, but declined. Without time to find a suitable replacement, the promotion canceled the pay-per-view, the first time in their history, and Dana placed the blame entirely on Jones, as did Sonnen, who was ultra popular at the time, and going on ESPN to further disparage the champion. 152 was quickly booked with the only available talent for such a quick turnaround, Vitor Belfort. The Phenom suddenly became every fan's favorite fighter. They were desperate for John to get what he had coming, which apparently was a beatdown at the hands of a suspiciously testosterone elevated Belfort, although nobody knew it at the time but the UFC who didn't bother to inform Jones. The only reason Vitor's suspect TRT-related numbers emerged, an accidental email sent to fighters and managers by some lowly UFC paralegal, a cover-up John believed was intentional after the fact. The narrative was simple going into 152. Jones bad, Belfort good. But if there's anything John Jones has been consistently great at despite whatever dumpster fire is raging in his life, it's fighting in the cage. And the champion would retain pretty easily, but for an armbar scare early in the fight. Number four, Anderson Silva versus Chael Sonnen 2. To say that the pressure on Anderson Silva going into his rematch with Chael Sonnen for the middleweight title at UFC 148 was isolated to the event would be to completely ignore what got us to that point in the first place. Everything really started two and a half years earlier in Abu Dhabi. The Spider put on a performance that embarrassed the UFC and angered fans. Dana White unwilling to even put the belt around the champion's waist. Left in the fourth round and I gave the bed belt to Ed and I said, you put it on him. I'm not doing it. After he stalled and did the bare minimum to defeat Damian Maya in front of a large group of newly acquired investors. This very unpopular fight resulted in a public campaign by Chael Sonnen, Silva's next opponent, unlike anything we'd ever seen in MMA before it. The bad guy had a golden tongue and was spewing as much venom as possible in the direction of the spider in the lead up to their August showdown. Chael's wrestling heel persona catching fire at the perfect time. Between his opponent's relentless verbal campaign and fans angry at Silva for his perceived phoning it in on fight night, UFC 117 
scene was high pressure, no doubt, but things would go from bad to worse after Sonnen dominated the fight for essentially five full rounds, but for the desperation triangle armbar that kept the title in Anderson's hands with less than two minutes left in the fight. To many fans, Silva got lucky, and while he would finish his next two opponents and regain some of his popularity, all that pressure from Chael and his trash talk would come back tenfold at UFC 148, the champion going in knowing he barely got by in their first encounter. It was one of the biggest rematches in the sport's history, and despite round one looking like round six of their first fight, Silva was able to regroup and get a second round TKO, a pretty spectacular feat all things considered. There's no question, in his legendary career, Anderson was never under more pressure than that Sun and rematch. Number three, Ronda Rousey versus Liz Carmouche. How about having the weight of an entire sport on your shoulders going into a fight? How's that for pressure? In 2012, Ronda Rousey was the reason Dana White changed his mind about women fighting in the UFC. Before her, the sport had of course seen its growth and many pioneers to boost Rousey to the point of getting White's attention, but it was her larger-than-life persona and domination in the cage that would give women's MMA the chance it deserved on the big stage. The UFC would make a women's bantamweight division officially and crown Rousey its champion before she ever stepped foot in the octagon. Now that alone is tremendous pressure, right? They essentially made this division for you, they give you the belt before you've even done anything there, something that did bother Rousey, but it was so much more than the expectation of that title. If Ronda Rousey lost that fight, the chances that women's MMA would be where it's at today, with three flourishing divisions in the UFC and some of the most popular athletes on the roster coming from them, is pretty much zero. In fact, I think the UFC would have abandoned this whole experiment if Rousey had tanked. And that's not some revisionist perspective, that was a sentiment many had at the time. So Rousey was not just fighting for the belt they'd handed to her at UFC 117 against Liz Carmouche, she was essentially fighting for the very future of women's mixed martial arts. I have no doubt that was running through Ronda's mind when she was caught in that neck crank, unwilling to tap because too much was on the line. The pressure was insane, and yet the rowdy one pulled through on that night and went on to massive success, earning a UFC Hall of Fame spot when it was all said and done. Number two, Jose Aldo versus Conor McGregor. Fighting Conor McGregor is a massive amount of pressure no matter who you are or when you fight him. All eyes are on you. You are the talk of the sport. His fans are ravenous. The man himself relentless in the build-up to a fight. And while all of his opponents have felt the heat leading up to a bout with the Notorious, nobody had it worse than featherweight champion Jose Aldo and his title defense at UFC 194. The King of Rio would be subjected to an extended campaign by the Irishman when their bout at UFC 189 was cancelled on short notice. The champion forced out with a rib injury. Honestly, it might have just been better to fight Connor at that point nearly incapacitated, because things would only get worse. In the lead-up to their initial fight date, McGregor and Aldo went on an unprecedented media tour that would see the pair at press conferences in Rio, Vegas, LA, Boston, New York, Toronto, London, and of course Dublin. A presser was pretty much Connor's domain, especially when you're talking about the logistics of even trying to combat him in that forum as a non-native English speaker. It was basically the listen to Aldo get battered on the microphone world tour. He cannot finish his dinner, let alone finish an opponent, so... Following McGregor's interim title win, the man was now basically a god going into the unification bout in the eyes of the fans. Aldo would again be forced to do the whole Connor media campaign yet again, all while doing a second full camp to fight the guy. Jose admittedly was overly emotional, overly committed as a result, and that 13 second finish says just about everything that needs to be said. Number one, Francis Ngannou versus Cyril Ghosn. Yes, you are correct, commenter. It was the inspiration for this list, but how could it not be? There's never been a situation that even comes close to what Francis Ngannou was facing at UFC 270. Where do I even start? How about the torn MCL and damaged ACL that he came into the fight with? Three weeks out, the guy's right knee gets shredded. Now, plenty of fighters fight with injuries, but when you consider the stakes for Ngannou on this night, the fact he didn't pull out is absolutely mind-blowing. There was also, of course, his history with Cyril Ghosn. The man was a former training partner. The two had sweated together. His former coach spent the lead-up to the fight bashing Francis. Again, this in and of itself isn't anything too big. This has happened several times in title defenses, but when you add it on to everything else, it really starts to compound. The biggest issue, of course, was Ngannou's UFC contract situation. The champ had chosen to play out his eight fights rather than re-signing for less, essentially putting his entire career on the line at 270. Had he lost, he'd likely have been cut and left to put the scraps of his life back together. He was banking on himself to pull through all that pressure. And of course, not only that, but the UFC was adding extra. The negative talk. The interim title. Francis said his team got word he might be sued by the promotion right before the fight for talking to a boxing promoter. The whole entire world was coming down on the heavyweight champion, and despite that, he shined, showing off a new wrinkle to his game in the process, and making it known there's no amount of pressure he can't handle. Big ol' shout out to my dude Luke Taylor for editing this
this video together. You can find him and his awesome digital art on Twitter at cool to me underscore. A big, big thank you to Ben Rosette, who provided that sweet tune you heard in the intro. Check out his music by clicking the link in the description and go give him a follow on his Instagram and Twitter page at Ben Rosette. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.